You may have been watching the news and keeping an eye on the Vanessa Guillen case out of Fort Hood, Texas. Well, Military Murder is a podcast about cases just like this. Murders that occur around the world at the hands of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and sometimes even veterans. In addition to extensive coverage of the Vanessa Guillen case, Military Murder recently featured an unsolved murder case out of North Carolina. Get this. During Memorial Day weekend this year, eight soldiers went camping, but only seven returned home. The eighth soldier's partial remains washed ashore six days later, and his death was ruled a homicide. The case involves a sketchy 911 call with conflicting information by the friends and a $25,000 reward offered by Army investigators looking for the public's help. New episodes of Military Murder are available every Monday wherever you listen to podcasts. And with a backlog of 40 episodes, there is plenty of content for you to binge. Now go on, subscribe and listen to Military Murder. Reach Freaks. Invisible Choir explores detailed depictions of violence and murder and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. What happens when a painful breakup blurs the lines between love and obsession? Can the dark seeds of envy and the longing for what is no longer yours result in deadly consequences? Stay tuned to find out, this time on Invisible Choir. Um, she would show me, like, transactions that he would do and everything would go through his email. I opened the door and you could just immediately hear screaming. At first I thought it was an animal. We noticed there was some brain matter on scene and... And at that time, pretty much knew her injuries were incompatible with life. Obsession, rejection, and envy have all been memorialized for centuries in art, song, literature, and even poetry. These complex feelings can result in an emotional pain so deep they can be felt on a physical level. For most of us, it's an unavoidable reality of life. But what separates us from each other is how we handle that pain. Or does it come down to simple resiliency? Or are some capable of coping and others not? Some of us simply bury the feelings and turn inward with self-destructive behaviors and addictions, while others may choose to ignore them and continue living their lives on a superficial level, choosing to never feel vulnerable again. And yet others are able to use the pain as an opportunity for growth and to challenge themselves to do better, to be better. It's these painful life lessons that shape us into better versions of ourselves. But what happens when we don't have the skills to deal with the pain that comes from rejection? What happens? When the rejected person feels let on, deceived, replaced, or even used, it can lead to rationalizing extreme retaliatory behavior. And that kind of irrational self-justification can fester into an unhealthy obsession, an obsession that consumes the person until all they can think about is their need to regain control. They rationalize their righteous and resentful feelings towards the person they believe has taken something from them or has replaced them. In the extreme cases, they may even rationalize taking another person's life. When 32-year-old Brenda Delgado met Dr. Ricardo Peniagua, or Ricky as he was known to friends, in August of 2012, she knew she had met her soulmate. Not just because he was a good person with similar interests, but because he was a handsome physician. And deep down inside, she always knew that she deserved to be a doctor's wife, and that she deserved to be rich and spoiled, and to live in a mansion where she was treated special, not just for who she was, but for who she was with. Brenda Delgado was finally going to take her rightful place in society. Her life was finally going to be easy. Just three months into her new relationship, she told Ricky that her roommate was getting married and was planning to take over their apartment. She asked to move in with him, and even though he had reservations, he reluctantly said yes. Ricky, who was a Stanford graduate, came from humble beginnings, with hardworking parents and a close extended family. That family, who were usually so loving and welcoming, immediately developed a dislike for Brenda. They thought that she was rude, entitled, and controlling. Ricky thought maybe they didn't understand her and were seeing her at her worst, but eventually, he noticed some of the same things about Brenda. Ricky disliked the way she would interrogate him daily and how she wanted to control every minute of his free time. She was extremely jealous and constantly accused him of being naive around other women. She thought nearly every woman wanted to take what was hers and she expected Ricky to let all other women know that he was unavailable in the most overt and unnecessary of ways. At the time, Ricky was still working as a resident in the dermatology department at a teaching hospital in Dallas. His days were long and he didn't have a lot of extra money, but Brenda didn't care. He was a doctor and she still demanded expensive things and to be taken on lavish vacations. After all, she wanted everyone to know she was dating a wealthy physician and demanded to be draped in the evidence of his success and devotion. In school, she was asked to describe herself to her new classmates, and instead of talking about herself, she told the entire class that she was dating a rich doctor. She even emphasized that dermatologists made the most money. The strange introduction left a bad impression with many of her classmates. Her controlling and clingy personality eventually led to their breakup in July of 2014. Ricky had just finished taking his medical boards and was wrapping up in his residency program. 
He was making plans to return to San Francisco to be closer to his family. He never intended on staying in Texas. He told Brenda he had some big decisions to make and wanted to take some time out for himself. He eventually asked her to move out and the two remained friends. They still exchanged text messages regularly and Brenda still looked for any opportunity for the two of them to spend time together. She asked for assistance and rides whenever she could and always offered to help him with anything that he needed. He repeatedly thanked her but told her he didn't want to lead her on and take any more of her time. Ricky also employed Brenda's mother as his housekeeper. She remained working for Ricky even after their breakup. This meant that Brenda still had access to Ricky's apartment. More importantly, his personal belongings. She had access to his computer, his phone, and even his email and bank accounts. She also had copies of his driver's license and social security card. So when Ricky began online dating, Brenda had access to his new dating profile and would occasionally delete contacts from other women before he could see them. Brenda's obsession with Ricky Peniagua continued escalating to the point even her new roommate grew increasingly concerned. I kind of understood like her anger, but at the same time, she was like super obsessed with him. You mentioned emails. Did she talk about things that she had access to related to Ricky? Um, the bank accounts, Gmail, um, pretty much a house key where he lived. Um, Ricky wouldn't be there most of the time. So um, she also had her mom. Um, at the time, she was cleaning his house. Brenda's mom? Yes. And just so we're clear, because you kind of stumbled, did you say that she had house key? Yes. She still had a few stuff over his apartment, as I recall. Did she tell you that she had access to his bank account? Um, she would show me like transactions that he would do, and everything would go to his email. Ricky was single and looking to meet new people, so he decided it would be fun to combine the search for new love with learning something new, so he signed up for salsa dancing lessons. Instead of meeting new people, through serendipity, he met people he already knew. More specifically, he ran into Brenda Delgado. He was more than a little surprised when a few weeks after he started his lessons, Brenda showed up to take lessons too. Ricky thought it was just a funny coincidence that they were both taking dance lessons at the same studio at the same time. Brenda thought the universe was trying to tell them something. Prior to that, around September of 2014, I had started to attend a salsa dance class. And what part of town was that in? It was north of Dallas. Uh, I could point it out on the map, but I don't recall right offhand. And while you're taking this salsa dancing class, was there a time where Brenda Delgado showed up at those same classes? Yes, sir. For the first two weeks, I would I was there in the class, and after about the second week, it was a weekly class, and after the second week, then uh, Brenda started showing up at the class. Had you any idea that she was going to be taking the same class? No, sir. And so just so the point's clear, the class starts, you're in it, <clears throat> then later on, she's part of the class. Yes, sir. And in conversations that you and I have had, you've talked, have, have we talked about how, what takes place during those classes? So this was a, a this was the type of class in which you the the partners rotate the men rotate from one uh, woman to to another uh, the time at which you dance with one individual is three to five minutes typically. And so if you're going down the rotation, at some point you end up having Brenda as your dance partner. Yes, sir. Is that difficult? At first, yes. Eventually, Brenda and Ricky would practice after class and sometimes get coffee or a drink. The seemingly fateful reunion led them to getting back together in October of 2014. They were both ready to give their relationship another try, but this time things were different. They lived separately, but quickly began having the same issues as before. Ricky had still planned to move back to California after completing his residency. He didn't see himself taking Brenda with him or including her in his plans for the future. He believed the relationship was more casual this time around without expectations, a belief he was continually open and honest about, though Brenda chose to ignore him. She always believed she could change his mind. And then. They broke up a final time in February of 2015. This time, Ricky sent her a long email explaining how he felt about her and how he hoped they could remain friends. He also requested that she remove herself from his phone account. Brenda was very offended by the casual manner in which he initiated the breakup. She believed she deserved more than an email. Ricky soon began casually dating again, eventually creating an online dating profile on Match.com. But what previously seemed like serendipitous chance encounters began occurring more frequently as Brenda kept running into Ricky on all of his dates. He also ran into her regularly when he went jogging on the Katy Trail near his home. Brenda hoped that their repeated and seemingly organic encounters would lead to another reconciliation. Unfortunately, Ricky never saw their chance encounters as the desperate foreshadowing of Brenda's growing obsession with him or her increasingly darker intentions. Well, I, what I recall is that between about March 2015 to May 2015, that typically my expectation would be that about every seven to ten days that I would pass her uh, running on the Katy Trail. It struck you as odd in any way? 
at the time, I thought it was just coincidence. I, yeah. Brenda had the passwords to Ricky's email and would regularly forward copies of his messages to herself. She also had all of his banking information, photos from social media of any women he dated, and could track him on a cloned iPhone 24-7. She was able to read every text message he sent or received. She still needed to feel like she was part of his life. However, she was torn because she wanted him back, but she also wanted him to hurt. Brenda wanted to punish Ricky for his rejection, and in February of 2015, she asked her younger 20-year-old cousin, Moses Martinez, to help her out by hurting her then-ex-boyfriend. She wanted her cousin to take a baseball bat and put Ricky in a coma, or possibly worse, but he said no, that he would never do anything like that, and reported her intentions to his mother. Brenda's aunt then told Brenda's mother, though she would eventually deny the accusations. Eventually, both mothers believed Brenda over her younger cousin. The situation created a rift in the family. No matter, no one ever warned Ricky of the foiled plot, nor did they report it to police. Then, things changed for Brenda in May of that year. Intuitively, she knew that things had also changed and that Ricky had met someone, who she would quickly perceive as a mortal threat to their future happiness. Ricky met 35 year old Dr. Kendra Hatcher, a pediatric dentist, through the mobile Tinder app. Kendra, one of five children, grew up in a small town of just 800 people outside of Springfield, Illinois. Her mother described her as the perfect child, someone who was hardworking and the recipient of many academic scholarships. She was selected as her high school salutatorian and majored in Spanish in college. She wanted to graduate fluent in another language so she could someday communicate with her young patients in their own native language. At first, she wanted to be a pediatrician, but later decided she wanted to pursue a career in dentistry. She also went to Spain, Guatemala, and Ecuador to provide free dental care to underprivileged children living in poverty-stricken conditions. She loved all the children, and they all loved her back. In all of her travel photos, she was surrounded by smiling kids. Kendra had a generous spirit and an innate desire to help others. Specifically, she wanted to connect with children and calm their fears while restoring their smiles. She had a purity that captured the right kind of attention. Kendra was very special, and Brenda could never hope to compete with someone so principled, accomplished, and beautiful. Kids, pediatrics. Why did she choose that? <laughs> she loved children, even though she didn't ever have any of her own. Um, and <laughs> she, wanted, <laughs> she wanted to be able to speak to them in Spanish, take their fears away. <laughs> she, she would share with me the most awesome letters that the parents would give to Kendra, saying how the child that Kendra took care of loved her, and she just, um, she, she, she was very good at her job. Aside from you know, practicing dentistry here in Dallas, did she ever go anywhere else? I mean, once she became a dentist to, to provide services, dental services. Uh, she did. She spent, she actually, um, she, she went over to Spain and then she went to, um, oh gosh, she went abroad. I can't even think. Guatemala is that? Right? Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. She went over to Guatemala and she had spent a lot of time over there too and had um, a lot of pictures with the kids. Um, that she sent back to us that we, of course, will treasure forever. All of her pictures were just kids, with the kids. Everything is with the kids. Crowds of kids. <laughs> the kids loved her. Kendra and Ricky's relationship was moving fast. They both had been married previously and divorced, and they recognized in each other that their search for true love was finally over. Ricky had flown Kendra to his parents' home three times in San Francisco, and there were pictures of the two of them with his family all over social media. Ricky's family had embraced Kendra in a way that they never did Brenda. Brenda had all of their photos on her phone and would show them to anyone who would listen whether they asked or not. She was obsessed and told everyone how upset she was over Ricky's rejection of her. Brenda even created a fake profile on Facebook and became friends with both Kendra and Ricky. She read all of the warm comments Ricky's family made to Kendra and about Kendra and saw firsthand their acceptance of her, and it filled her with rage. It was clear to Brenda that Ricky's new relationship was somehow different than hers. This new love caused her to worry. In fact, Ricky and Kendra were already making plans for a fast-tracked future together. Kendra told her parents that she had met the man of her dreams and wanted to bring him back to Illinois to meet the family on September 28th of that year. Only, they would never make it to that weekend. She had... Our, fam our family is pretty close and Kendra had met Ricky. And she... Her and my oldest daughter are like, they came from definitely the same seed. And she called my oldest daughter, Jamie, and said that she had met someone and she was pretty happy. Um, so much so, they'd only dated for a little over three months. Kendra was um, bringing them home September 28th to meet the family. 
2015? 2015, of course, this happened September 2nd, so we never... This was a pretty serious relationship that they had. Uh, I, it was, yeah, it was pretty fast moving because I questioned her. I'm like, Kendra, are you, are you sure about this? And she said, yeah, I'm bringing him home. I've already bought the plane tickets on September 28th. And September was Kendra's favorite time of the year, the fall festivals and stuff in a small town. And so she wanted all of us to get together and show Ricky um, what a small town was like with the pumpkins and the festivals. And I said, well, okay, I guess we'll meet him then. I didn't know how Ricky was going to feel about it. <laughs> we hadn't met him yet, so. Kendra had already met Ricky's family more than once, and they loved her and were looking forward to her being a part of their family. But what neither family knew that Brenda did was that Ricky and Kendra were planning to move to California together and had already looked into buying a home. Brenda's irrational rage was growing by the day. Her obsession would not allow for Ricky to move on without her. Brenda had already approached her family about helping her to get revenge on Ricky, and it resulted in a family conflict, so she knew that she had to reach outside of her immediate friends and family for the kind of assistance she would need to bring her dark plans for Kendra Hatcher into fruition. Brenda began associating with a younger and seedier crowd of people. They were the kind of folks who didn't have the same morals and values with which she was raised. In fact, human value for this new crowd came down to an astonishingly low price. They were people living on the fringe of society, involved with drugs and street crime, and to Brenda's benefit, they were willing to commit unspeakable acts for very little gain. Brenda seduced and corrupted her new friends with promises of money and supplies of endless drugs. After all, she looked the part. Though Brenda worked as a modest dental hygienist, she prioritized her expenses, and one of them was her car. She drove a white Lexus sports car and waved around cash to project affluence. She also told people that she was related to the drug cartels in Mexico and implied that she had deep connections and even deeper pockets. She told me that first she wanted Ricky in a coma with the bat, the bat that is right in front of me. Um, also, for Kendra Hatcher, um, an injection needle to put it in her back of her neck. Um, she just wanted to eliminate Kendra Hatcher or even both of them. And in return for doing that, what were you supposed to do? Drugs, um, $2,000 and a car. Brenda moved a 23-year-old woman named Jennifer Escobar into her apartment and offered her unlimited drugs and a free car if she would hurt Ricky and kill Kendra Hatcher. Her plan was to have Ricky beaten up enough to be hospitalized and put into a coma. This would allow for her to nurse him back to health and still wind up with her prize. Disgustingly, she had other, more permanent plans for Kendra, but Jennifer and Brenda had a falling out, and she moved out just two weeks later. The falling out never led Jennifer to contact the police, Brenda's family, or even Ricky and Kendra to let them know that they were in danger. However, during the brief period they did live together, Jennifer introduced Brenda to a young mother she knew from high school, a young woman named Crystal Cortez. Cortez was the mother of a six-year-old son, and she too was quickly roped into Brenda's fantasy of killing Kendra Hatcher to reignite her relationship with Ricky. After just a few meetings, Brenda offered Crystal a similarly lucrative deal, this time $500 cash, unlimited drugs, and a car. At some point in time, was there a discussion about, about the situation, what she wanted to have done? Yes. What was the discussion? She wanted to get rid of Kendra Hatcher. And why did she want to get rid of Kendra Hatcher? Because she was envious of her. So, did you... Did she ask for any help, or how, what, what was your role in this? She did ask for help. She asked if I knew anybody who could take care of it. And that's when I became an, uh, what, uh, a play member in it. I'm sorry, you did what? That's how I became a play member in it. And you were, uh, did you, uh, at some point in time, start out planning this, this event? Yes, I did. <clears throat> how often do you think you and Brenda Delgado had discussions about, uh, about doing something in this hatchery? Almost every day. Was this in person <laughs> that you were talking? Yes. Did you also have phone conversations? No phone conversations. Did you call her on the phone, though, from time to time? Yes. Did y'all have text messages? Yes. Brenda spent nearly every waking hour talking about eliminating her new romantic rival. Her growing rage was palpable. She had an obvious inability to separate her desire for true everlasting love with her growing obsession to end Kendra Hatcher's life. She was consumed by her fantasies of murdering the person who had dared to replace her, the person who so easily captured the heart, mind, and devotion of the man she loved and had given two and a half years of her life to. To Brenda Delgado, it was insulting to watch someone gain what belonged to her in just four short months. Was, were there different plans on what to do? Yes. What were some of the plans that you all had worked on? Um, one was to inject her with heroin. Another one was to inject her with a sedative. And the other was to kill her with a gun. Crystal thought it would be better to hire out the actual killing and that she could serve as the getaway driver. So she eventually found someone by the name of Christopher Love, who was willing and eager to serve as the hitman. 
Christopher Love would be paid $2,000 and receive an unlimited supply of marijuana and cocaine from Brenda's fictional cartel connections. Christopher and Crystal never questioned Brenda's claims that she was related to the cartels in Mexico. They were easily persuaded and misled by her lies. It never once dawned on them why someone with alleged cartel connections couldn't find a professional killer themselves to take out her rival. Now that Brenda had her hit team in place, they needed to figure out how they were actually going to kill Kendra Hatcher. They eventually decided that a bullet was the most efficient and effective means to swiftly eliminate Ricky Peniagua's new love interest. What was Christopher Love supposed to get out of all? He was supposed to get drugs and money out of it. And what were you supposed to get? Just money. And did she tell you how she was going to get these drugs and money and, and indicate to Christopher Love and, and to you where, what, her, what her source of money and drugs were? Um, she told us that she was part of the cartel, but that we didn't really know because she was flaunting her money. Because she was, she was doing what with her money? Flaunting her money. Did she have a lot of, was she spreading a lot of money around, it seemed? Yes. Uh, you already told us that she drives a Lexus. Yes. You said that she had access to a, a Mustang. Yes. You know whose Mustang that was? Her cousin's. A nice looking... Mustang. Okay. Um, She's going to put, trying to trying to buy this Mitsubishi Galant. Galant. Uh, later, y'all see you see her later in a BMW. Is that right? Yes, she had a friend who owns like a dealer's a car dealer ship, and she borrows the BMW from him. Right. Uh, is she also spending money? Like, is it easy for her to spend money? Yes, it is. <clears throat> now, you use the word "we" uh, often. Yes. You're talking about "we." Who are the people that you're talking about? Me, Brenda Delgado, and Christopher Love. Crystal and Brenda closely followed Kendra around for two weeks while they learned her daily routine and decided on the best place to get her alone and eventually to kill her. Brenda knew from her ongoing cyberstalking that Ricky and Kendra were planning on flying out to Cancun on September 3rd. To Brenda, this was a critical decision point. She couldn't allow them to go on a romantic getaway, but she certainly couldn't risk them getting engaged while on vacation. Brenda already knew that Kendra was taking steps to become a licensed dentist in California. She also knew that they had discussed saving together for a wedding fund and that Ricky was looking for a house to buy when they both moved to California in October of that year. Brenda and Crystal both knew that September 2nd was the last possible chance they would have to kill Kendra before her and Ricky firmly cemented their future together. Uh, did you know uh, where you wanted to uh, commit this capital murder? Um, we weren't really sure as to where. We were just trying to like figure our way around. Where were, uh, what did you do in order to try to figure out the best place to, to commit this? We started following Kendra Hatcher and her routine. And whose idea was it to follow her around? It was mine and Brenda's idea. When uh, there had been some talk at one point in time that there was a tracker device used on, uh, there were some allegations to that, but there wasn't a tracker used on, on Ms. Hatcher's. No. Uh, what about uh, Ricky's phone? Were they, was there something able to be done with Ricky's phone? Yes, Brenda had Ricky's iPhone account um, logged into another iPhone. And she was able to track him that way to see when they bought the plane tickets to Mexico, to San Francisco, and what was going on with the purchase on the house in San Francisco. Okay, you could tell that he was looking at places to go when he moved to San Francisco. Yes. <clears throat> was it, so you all knew that they were taking, they were planning on taking a trip to Mexico on uh, September 3rd? Yes, Labor Day weekend. And was that why, uh, or does that have something to do with uh, this all happening on September 2nd? Yes, because after Labor Day weekend, they were moving back to San Francisco. With the clock now ticking on their twisted plan, Brenda needed to provide Crystal and Chris with a getaway car. She had a close family friend who was also her mechanic, the same mechanic who would routinely perform work on Ricky's car when he needed it done. That mechanic was Brenda's close friend, Jose Ortiz. Brenda took elaborate measures to create a backstory that would provide her with a car for the murder. The night before the planned hit, she asked another friend of hers who was legitimately having car trouble to switch cars with her. She told her friend that she was going to have a mechanic friend look at his car the next day for free and that he could diagnose the problem and tell him what was wrong with it. That car was a gold BMW. On the morning of the planned hit, Brenda and Crystal took the gold BMW to her friend Jose's and asked him to diagnose the problem, pretending all along it was Crystal's car. Brenda asked Jose if her friend Crystal could borrow another car off Jose's lot while her car was being worked on, so he lent her a black 1996 Jeep Cherokee. Crystal and Brenda left in the Jeep and Crystal dropped Brenda off at the library in an effort to help establish her an alibi for the day. Crystal then took the Jeep and picked up their contract hitman, Christopher Love. The pair then stole temporary plates off a Dodge Durango and traded them out for the license plates on the Jeep. They then drove to Kendra Hatcher's work, hiding out in plain sight until her shift was over, and eventually, they followed her home. But on the way, they ended up losing Kendra on the freeway during heavy traffic. They didn't know she was taking a detour to a friend's house to borrow an underwater camera for her vacation the next day. So when they lost Kendra, they decided to go directly to her underground parking structure and wait in a nearby visitor spot. When they finally saw Kendra enter the parking garage in her white 2007 Toyota Camry, 
The pair followed her directly through the security gates, where Crystal parked the Jeep directly across from Kendra's car. Christopher Love exited the Jeep and quickly approached Kendra, catching her off guard. He was wearing a mask and brandishing a gun. The frightened Kendra instinctively began screaming for help. When Chris Love demanded her purse, she fell to the ground and cowered in fear, desperately crying out for someone to help her. Uh, basically, went out around 7, went down to the elevators. Once I opened the door, you could just immediately hear screaming. At first, I thought it was an animal because it was just distorted a little bit. I couldn't really understand what it was, so I thought it was like a dog freaking out, maybe. And then after probably five seconds of screaming, you just heard pop, pop. And after those pops, you hear the car door close, tires screech, and then the car coming down uh, the ramp. Do you, you remember what type of vehicle you saw coming down the ramp? I think I recall it was a Jeep Cherokee, an old version. Were you able to see who was inside the vehicle? No, sir. The windows were tinted. Without pause and without mercy, Christopher Love coldly shot Kendra in the back of her head execution style as she cowered beneath her open car door. The bullet entered the back of her head and exited out the bottom of her chin. Christopher then took Kendra's purse and the underwater camera she was clutching in her hands. He then jumped back into the black Jeep and stayed on the floor until it was safe to sit up. Both he and Crystal, now filled with adrenaline by the callous act they just carried out, drove to an open field and wiped down the entire Jeep for fingerprints. Crystal then dropped Christopher Love off at his house, but unbeknownst to her, she was caught on surveillance camera driving the Jeep while exiting the parking structure. The crime scene left first responders in a state of confusion as they attempted to ascertain exactly what happened after the initial reports of shots fired came in. Uh, we saw a car, we saw a patient laying on her back with the driver's side door open. She was just a little bit up underneath. As we approached, uh, we saw a little trauma, or I saw a little trauma just under her chin. We had a little bit of uh, blood in the area, a little bit of pulling. Uh, but immediately, me and my partner just went to work. We didn't waste a lot of time. We felt for a pulse. At the time when we found her, she was just a little bit, maybe chest high underneath the passenger door with a driver's side door that was open. So we moved her back maybe about a foot and a half, two feet, so we could be able to start our operations. My partner got on her side, and once we didn't feel a pulse, he started compressions. I quickly got an IV in her right arm and just continued our work from there, maybe about maybe a minute or so before we started to realize that there was going to be nothing coming back from this. So what would be the initial life-saving measures you would take for something like this? Initial life-saving in this situation for our protocols, uh, we started CPR. Immediately I got IV access uh, so we can start using the drugs that go with our protocols. After I grabbed that, I grabbed what's called a BDM mask. It just assists with respirations for the patient. Um, at that time, <clears throat> he was doing compressions. I just got access. I had all my equipment pulled out, ready to start breathing, and I noticed there was some blood. Um, but when we pulled the victim back, we saw some blood at the scene. But as I was about to start breathing, we noticed blood was starting to run from the back of her head. So I reached around and found what would have been either entrance or exit wound at the time. I wasn't sure. And at that time, pretty much knew her injuries were incompatible with life. So we ceased our operations. So when you say her injuries were incompatible with life, you're telling the jury that it's basically apparent that she was no longer with us. Yes, sir. We noticed there was some brain matter on scene, and with those injuries, there's nothing more you can do. Is there anything further you do after that? No, sir. We just uh, we try to clean up the area best we can, but we try not to move anything. We just kind of step aside and let the officers come in. After dropping off Christopher Love, Crystal drove to her grandmother's house to pick up her six-year-old son, as if it were any other normal workday. She thanked her grandmother for watching the boy and then took her son to the Sonic Burger for dinner. It was one of their favorite places to go. On her way to dinner with her son, she phoned Brenda. The two spoke for nearly 45 minutes after the murder, and later that night, Brenda went and met her friend Jose for drinks at a local Chili's. They waited for Crystal Cortez to show up in the Jeep so that they could exchange cars. Her son had fallen asleep in the back seat on the ride over, so Jose helped carry the sleeping boy to the BMW. Their long, exhausting day was nearly over. Right before the murder occurred, Ricky Peniago was actually waiting upstairs in Kendra Hatcher's apartment. He'd arrived at just after 7 p.m. After waiting and wondering where she had disappeared to, Ricky texted Kendra as to her whereabouts, and she texted back that she was on her way and had just made a stop to borrow an underwater camera from her friend for their vacation. She thought she would be there by 7.30, but it was looking more like she would arrive at 7.45. The two had plans to spend the night at her house and leave for their vacation together the very next morning. Uh, I'm at her apartment at that time. I get back from running about 7.15 p.m., and I am at her apartment until about just after 8 p.m. So what happens after 8 p.m.? So I, I send, I'm waiting for Kendra to, to come back to her place. Um, a little before 8 o'clock, I send her a message um, just saying that I'm starting to get a little bit you know, hungry and kind of checking on her in terms of her dinner plans. Um, this time, just to 
in contrast to the message that was that I had sent uh, at just past 7.30, in which that was shown as delivered. Now this one that was sent just before 8 o'clock, it, it was not showing as delivered. The message wasn't going through. Um, about 10 minutes after that, a little after 8 o'clock, I sent a follow-up message um, saying that I'm starting to get a little bit lightheaded. I'm going to go and, and get some food. And so then I, I leave her apartment. This would have been about 8.05 8 p.m. I leave her apartment, which is located on the 17th floor. I go down to the first floor. I kind of walk around her building, and there's a there's a taco stand that's uh, immediately across the street from where she lived, and right next to Mesomaya. And so I um, walk to the taco stand um, at about 8, 8.05, 8, 10 p.m. Ricky eventually texted Kendra back to let her know that there was some type of commotion going on in her apartment parking structure, with police cars and fire trucks blocking the entrance. So he alerted her that she may need to find another place to park for the evening. He wondered what was still going on in the parking structure hours later. It looked like there were even more police cars than he had seen before. He thought it must be something serious and hoped that no one was harmed. When he eventually returned, the doorman would no longer allow Ricky to go upstairs to Kendra's apartment. Fearing the worst, Ricky Peniagua's instinct kicked in. He still hadn't heard from Kendra, and he began to worry that whatever was going on downstairs might have involved her. Well, I had seen that um, when I went to the taco stand uh, a little bit earlier, like around 8.15, I, I had already um, seen that there was commotion. In fact, I had sent a, a message to, to Kendra saying, you know, hey, you know, by the way, your the entrance to your um, parking garage seems to be blocked. You, it doesn't look like you're going to be able to, to get in. You'll probably have to find another place to park tonight. Um, so I, I was already aware that there was something going on. I just had no idea what, what was going on there. So when you go back and you're asked to hold up, in terms of you going up to the 17th floor, what happens after that? So then that's that's where I start panicking. And now I'm just now just the possibility of something happening to Kendra starts to enter my mind, and I'm really. Uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm scared, I'm panicking, I, I just, I don't know, um, I'm asking, uh, I'm asking them to tell me, you know, what's going on, you know, where's Kendra, I keep asking that, where's Kendra, I'm, I'm texting her saying, you know, let me in, they're not letting me in, you know, and, um. Ricky is quickly pulled aside by investigators and questioned, and told that Kendra was the victim of an armed robbery, and that she died in the parking structure. Devastated, he called his sister Angelica, who hopped on the next flight to Dallas. Somewhere in the back of his mind, he briefly wondered if Kendra's cold-blooded murder had anything to do with his ex-girlfriend, Brenda, but he quickly dismissed the idea. To relieve his concerns, he texted Brenda that night and told her that his girlfriend had been killed. Brenda quickly responded and immediately offered to come over with food and groceries and offered up anything she could do to help her grieving ex. The next day, Ricky had his sister Angelica text Brenda back regarding her offer to bring food, so Angelica and Brenda tentatively make plans for Brenda to come over the next day with the groceries. Brenda is ecstatic because her plan seemed to have finally worked. Ricky is already reaching out to her for help. Brenda has just a few loose ends to clear up. The police released a picture of the getaway driver, along with the Jeep that was used in Kendra's shooting, to the media, and asked them for help in identifying the woman driving the Jeep, along with the owner of the car. The day after the murder, Jose Ortiz received a call from his brother, telling him that it looked like his Jeep was used in the murder. He asked him if the Jeep was still on the lot, or if it had possibly been stolen. Jose initially pleaded ignorance, claiming that it must be another black 1996 Jeep. Concerned about his brother's observations, he then called Brenda. They make a plan to meet, and Jose shows her the picture and asks her if she knew that her friend Crystal used his Jeep to commit a murder. Brenda insists it's a different car and that Jose has nothing to worry about, but he couldn't shake the feeling that she was lying, so he asked her again, did your friend use my car to murder a dentist? Brenda tells him that Crystal is involved with drugs and that she may have used his Jeep in a drug deal. She then tells Jose that Crystal is dangerous and that she has ties to Mexican drug cartels and instructs him not to take her calls. Brenda then instructs Jose to hide the Jeep and offers to pay him to have the car painted. She also warns Jose against contacting the police, as it may interfere with his immigration status. Jose sleeps on a request, and the next day, phones a client of his who is a police officer. So, in the conversation, I was like, well, I don't know what to do. Um, she just like, uh, well, why, why don't we just, you know, just don't say anything, don't tell your people, don't tell your family, don't tell anybody. You can get uh, in trouble with the police. You might, you, then risking your citizenship. Uh, it's best for you to just hide it and probably paint it a different color if you want to help you pay for that paint job. So I just I just went along with it and and her idea was to just hide it, I guess, in my shop. And I just follow along with it. And at this point, I'm, I'm in shock. I'm, I, I don't know what's going on. I, I find myself like in a confusion zone where I, I need to put puzzle together and do the right thing before and think about things, but I wasn't like really thinking out loud, I can believe that something this bad is happening to me. 
I never saw it coming. So I just, I just, I, I, I just agree with her to just drop out my Jeep at, at my shop. And I thought, okay, I'll just hide it there. That's when I throw her in. And, uh, she followed me to drop it off on my shop. And then after that, um, I dropped her off at her house. When I dropped her off at her house, I went home. Still shocked, and now and I needed time. I really needed time to think about this. And it wasn't until next day that I called police. Jose cooperates fully with the police and tells them the story of Crystal and Brenda dropping off a gold BMW for repairs and then dropping off the loaner Jeep the very next night, the night of the murder. Things begin quickly falling apart for Brenda. She woke up the day after Kendra's murder happy and ready to reinsert herself back into Ricky's life. She had a goal to remove her rival, and she accomplished that goal as a self-proclaimed mastermind who never once had to pull a trigger. She was now ready to reclaim her life and her rightful place at Ricky's side. Unfortunately, Ricky and Angelica had heard from law enforcement that a woman was involved in Kendra's murder. Both immediately took concern after seeing the grainy photo, believing it resembled Brenda Delgado. Angelica texted Brenda and asked her not to come by with the groceries. At the same time, Brenda received a phone call from Detective Eric Barnes from the Dallas Police Department asking her to come down for an interview regarding Kendra's murder. Detective Barnes reassured Delgado, as the ex-girlfriend of Kendra's current romantic partner, that the interview was merely a formality and that he just wanted to eliminate her as a suspect, so she quickly agreed to cooperate and help officers catch Kendra's killer, explaining that she was willing to do anything to help Ricky. At first, Detective Barnes only wanted to establish Brenda's schedule the day of the murder. He asked her how she knew Jose and if she had borrowed his Jeep, but Brenda does a masterful job of avoiding the questions by both over-answering and under-responding. Again and again, she gave long answers that never provided any clear information that was specifically being asked. For over an hour, she never once mentioned Crystal's name. She insists that they have the wrong car, and if it was indeed the Jeep they borrowed, that she certainly wasn't involved. During the interview, Brenda touches Detective Barnes's arms repeatedly and flirts with him, telling him she likes his bracelet. She acts as if they are on a first date rather than being questioned in a murder investigation. Also, uh, during this point in the, the interview, um, one of the things that I noticed uh, was uh, Miss Delgado's posture. Um, she was wearing a low-cut shirt, a uh, V-neck shirt, and once I started asking questions that she was having a difficulty answering, I noticed she kept leaning forward, um, almost just pushing her breast up. Um, and I don't know if it was some form of distraction, but she was posturing. Um, I failed to, to kind of get me off guard or distract the interrogation. For every question he asks, she asks another in return, like where he lives or how many siblings he has. But Detective Barnes is fully aware of what Brenda Delgado is doing, the game she's playing. So he continues answering her questions, attempting to build rapport. Brenda tells him that she came to this country when she was just seven years old from Mexico and that she's currently in college and working as a dental hygienist. She also tells him all about her relationship with Ricky and insists that she never knew he had a girlfriend. Brenda explains that Ricky is very discreet and although they are still close friends, he would never discuss his girlfriend with her. She insists that they were never jealous of each other and that their relationship simply ran its course and that the two had remained good friends. But Detective Barnes shows Brenda a picture of the driver of the Jeep and explains that he believes it's her who is driving. She quickly denies the claim, explaining that it must be her friend, Crystal. When asked why Crystal would be at the site of a murder of her ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend, Delgado recalls that Crystal told her she was going to take her son out to dinner at the taco stand across the street from where Kendra lived, and that the parking structure nearby was the best place to park. Hiding behind a flirtatious smile, Brenda Delgado chalks the entire incident up to sheer coincidence. She then allows Detective Barnes to download the contents of her phone and firmly denies knowing who Kendra Hatcher is at all. So you think, is, is this a, in your mind, would you say it's a big coincidence? that your ex-boyfriend's girlfriend ends up dead and your friend ends up driving the same parking lot that this happens at around the same time that it happens in a Jeep that you borrowed. I think I, I Crystal borrowed the Jeep. I think that's what we're, we're getting because I wasn't. She needed the car. Okay. I didn't but, need the car. But even that, though, this is what I'm saying. Okay, Crystal borrows the Jeep. She borrows the Jeep from your friend. Yes. The key, the key thing in all this is you, okay? And I'm going to tell you why. The Jeep, the way Crystal gets the Jeep is through, through you, yeah. okay? The young lady that ends up dead, her boyfriend, the relation is you. You to him, sir. Crystal ends up in this parking garage. Your friend, your friend's Jeep, your ex-boyfriend's girlfriend. All three of those things point back to you. That is you. You're a common thing in all of these things. So what I'm asking you is, how does this happen? And that would make me very uncomfortable if my friend was in this area. My friend is borrowing my other friend's Jeep, and my ex-boyfriend's girlfriend gets killed. I, I asked her, I said, what were, she said that she went to do errands and then that she was going to eat at that restaurant and that she went in and out, like she went to find parking space and that's it. That's all. She had her kid with her and that's all. Well, there's, there's more to the situation than that. 
There really is. There's more to the situation than somebody looking for a parking spot. Somebody looking for a parking spot never got anybody killed. They never did. There's more to the story than that. And what's going to happen, this investigation is going to evolve. Okay. And I, what I want to tell you is that nobody, I don't care how good friends think they are or how tight bonds are between one person and another person. Since I've been doing this job, I haven't met one person that's been willing to get charged for murder for somebody else that they didn't do. During her interrogation, Brenda admits that although her and Ricky talked at least once a week, they never discussed their personal lives. They mostly talked about her schooling and his plans to move back to California. She repeatedly claims she never had any long-term plans to be with Ricky and would never want to harm him or his girlfriend. She tells Detective Barnes that she learned at a very young age not to be jealous and tells him all about a destructive relationship she had when she was just 18 years old. She then begins to cry, explaining that she was sexually abused as a young child, and because of that experience, she has always remained on guard in relationships and never gets too attached to anyone. Detective Barnes confronts her with the fact that two days before the murder, Ricky had canceled her phone line which was still in his name and that he was aware of a text message that Ricky had sent Brenda back on June 9th in 2015 that read, quote, uh, Hi, Brenda. I've started to date someone that I actually really like. This obviously means that several steps are now mandatory. One, getting the rest of your items. Two, changing your mailing address, because I continue to receive a ton of your mail. And three, establish your own phone line. This all should have happened months ago, but now it matters more to me, and I would like it to occur within the next week. Thank you for understanding. Brenda laughed at the text, claiming it was nothing, that it was no big deal, and that she switched her phone number into her own name two days before the murder. Detective Barnes then begins pressing Brenda for her timeline from the day of the murder and sensed a pattern of her giving long-winded answers to questions he never asked. When confronted with Jose's contradictory statements, Delgado reluctantly admits that she and Crystal returned the Jeep together to Jose the night of the murder, but claims she still doesn't believe that Crystal would know anything about Ricky's ex or want to harm her. She steadfastly sidesteps the implication that Crystal would only be present at the site of Kendra's murder at her own direction. As Detective Barnes slowly reveals more and more information gleaned from Jose, Brenda has no choice but to continually contradict her own timeline of events. It quickly becomes clear that she's losing control of the interrogation, but she never falters, simply exchanging one lie for another. In an effort to show Delgado that she is trapped within her own lies, Detective Barnes asked her to call Crystal. He makes it clear that he's going to question Crystal on why she was at the site of the murder of her ex-boyfriend's current lover while driving Jose's Jeep. So Brenda takes out her phone calling Crystal several times, but Crystal never once answers. She told Detective Barnes that she barely knew Crystal and had only met her a few months before. She contends they became fast friends because Brenda wanted to mentor her and to help her out. She explained that Crystal was a young mother and didn't have a very good job. He then asked her about her recent bank withdrawals, and she slowly admits to taking $700 cash out of the bank the day before the murder. Detective Barnes wants Brenda to realize that he has put the pieces together, that he can prove she paid a hitman to kill Kendra Hatcher. But Brenda continues remaining calm, insisting that the money was for car repairs. Sensing yet another lie, Detective Barnes slowly confronts Brenda and asks her why she told Jose to lie about the Jeep, revealing that he knows she asked him not to talk to police. Brenda then smoothly changes the subject, discussing the fact that Crystal is nothing but a liar, hell-bent on covering up the truth. He then tells her that Crystal has already arrived at the station, and that she's sitting in another interrogation room, telling detectives a vastly different story. I think it was hate. I think you hated the fact that you weren't good enough. Mm. That's the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts. You weren't good enough for Ricky. Maybe, maybe he didn't like the way you looked. I didn't. Maybe, maybe something you did got on his nerves. Maybe he didn't want a dental hygienist anymore. Maybe he wanted a dentist. Maybe you, went, maybe you just weren't good enough for him. Maybe his standards were a little bit too high for you. But for whatever reason, you weren't good enough for him. And that's a, that's a hard pill to swallow. It's very hard to swallow. For you to be able to look in the mirror and say, what is it that she has that I don't have? Maybe he didn't like the fact that your parents weren't well off. Maybe he didn't want to grow from the other world. And it hurts. I mean, I don't. How many feelings, like, like you're saying, I really don't have any. Like, I didn't know you know who the girl was. I had no idea. That's not true. You know who his girlfriend is. Just like you knew where he was taking his salsa lessons at because you followed him. I didn't. Yes, you have. I haven't. You've been following him before. You've been following him before. This is not your first time. This is not you. There's no accident. You told her where to go. Detective Barnes reveals to Brenda Delgado that he knows she stalked Ricky and that he also knows she hired Crystal to murder Kendra. He explains to her that he can prove it, using her phone records, Facebook history, and the CCTV footage from the parking structure. He also reveals that he now knows there was a plan for murder all along, and that she was the mastermind behind it all. And it's all over something that she couldn't have. Honestly, I'm telling you, there's no plan, there's nothing. There's, there's nothing that, there's no motive, I have no reason. Oh, there's plenty of motive. There's plenty of motive. You cannot have him as long as she's alive. That's not true. That is very true. He didn't want to be with you. 
If he had his choice right now, he still wouldn't want to be with you. You simply are not what he wants out of life. And it's hard for you to understand that. So, you, and I think you've understood it. I think you got a point whenever the phones got separated. This is it. This is it. Something has to happen because without, without me being able to, this is the last load. He's leaving in a, in a month. No, I mean, honestly, I'm telling you, there's, I was fine with anything. I didn't. The phone call, the, we were already talked about. I'm separating phones. It just never happened. It just took time. It took time. So what do you think? Your friend, Chris, what do you think she has to say? Both Crystal Cortez and Jose Ortiz were in other interview rooms at the station, and Detective Barnes wanted to use that fact to his advantage to get Brenda to admit to her involvement in Kendra's death. But Brenda never once showed signs of being nervous, and coldly but firmly stood her ground against a seasoned interrogator. She continued denying her involvement, and though Detective Barnes had claimed Crystal was spilling her guts in the room next door, Crystal hadn't shared a thing, and was just as actively and aggressively denying her involvement in Kendra's murder. But Detective Barnes wasn't sharing any of that knowledge. He wanted Brenda to think that Crystal was the one getting the benefit of the doubt and that police were prioritizing her truth over Brenda's. Crystal has no reason to want her dead. You know who has the motive? You know who has the motive? You know Crystal's motive was? To make some money to feed her kid. And I can understand that. I can understand what it's like. You took advantage of this young girl. Yes, she did. You took advantage of her because she's struggling. She has bills to feed, bills to pay, kids to feed. You took advantage of that. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. You took advantage of her. Brenda continued denying wanting to get back with Ricky, so Detective Barnes tried to elicit some emotion. He told her that they will never be together now that Ricky knows she had his girlfriend murdered. He tells her that her plan has been foiled, that it failed. But Brenda continues to remain emotionless and extremely calm given the circumstances. And she never once pretends to be outraged by the allegations, as someone might if they were innocent. Barnes explains to Brenda that she's now 33 years old and that her best years are behind her and that Ricky wasted two and a half years of her life. Wanting to build rapport, he explains how Ricky used her and how once he got his medical license, he simply discarded her for someone else, someone better. Someone more accomplished and more attractive. Another doctor who was on his level. Brenda never wavered for a second, but she sat in stunned silence, clearly confused at how her plan had failed. After his multiple attempts to elicit a confession came up short, Detective Barnes eventually made the decision to allow Brenda to leave so he could finish interrogating Crystal. It was a move he would quickly regret by the following day. After leaving the interview room on September 4th, 2015, Brenda Delgado fled south to Mexico. According to her accomplice, Crystal Cortez, it was Brenda's plan all along to flee the country in the event their plan was ever revealed. Delgado held dual citizenship and had extended family awaiting her eventual arrival. And I was interrogated by the police. And at first I was not upright and I didn't tell them the whole truth because I didn't know what to say and what not to say. Okay. Now, uh, did y'all think this was going to be as big of a deal as it turned out to be? No, we did not. Uh, did you think you were going to get caught? I'm pretty sure eventually we're going to get caught. But did you think it when you were planning to not get caught? Um, yes, Brenda told me that she was going to go to Mexico after the offense was committed, and I didn't have a backup plan, so, yeah. Brenda hit out with extended family in Mexico until April of 2016, enjoying nine long months of freedom. After the FBI placed her on the 10 most wanted list, she was quickly arrested by Mexican authorities within 48 hours. They eventually extradited her to the U.S. in October of 2016. After nine months of confusion and unanswered questions, the Hatcher family were relieved to learn that the mastermind behind Kendra's murder was finally being brought to justice. Since the state of Texas considered Kendra Hatcher's homicide to be a capital murder case, Mexico made a deal to extradite Brenda Delgado to the U.S. under strict conditions that they would drop consideration of the death penalty. For nearly two years, Crystal maintained that there was never a conspiracy to murder Kendra Hatcher. She insisted she was only the getaway driver for a robbery in which she was paid a measly $500. Um, the day after the murder, we went around, me and Brenda went to get the drugs and money to pay Christopher Love off because he had texted me about his payment. So, did you ever deliver any, any money or drugs to, to Christopher Love? Yes, we delivered cocaine and kush, which is a form of weed, and money as well. And, uh, do you know how much he got or, or what the total amounts were? I wasn't, um, fully aware about the total amount of cash, but, um, we spent like $600 on the weed and like $300 on cocaine. And, and then there was some amount of cash that you got. Yes. Did you get paid for this? Yes, I did. What did you get? I got five hundred dollars. And who who paid who paid you? Brenda did. And who uh, paid for the cocaine, the marijuana, and gave the money to? Brenda did. And that was in exchange for committing this this murder of Kendra Hunter. Yes. After two long years of denying everything, Crystal Cortez had a change of heart. She finally agreed to tell the entire truth after the death of her mother. Previously, she had been plagued with guilt and didn't want her mother to find out that she had played a part in a murder-for-hire scheme, all for a measly 
Coming from a religious upbringing, Crystal knew that her mother was now in a place where she had access to the truth. So she struck a deal to remove consideration of the death penalty in exchange for her truthful testimony and cooperation against both the trigger man Christopher Love and the mastermind Brenda Delgado. It was a deal the Hatcher family eventually gave their blessing to, all along sticking to their original goal that everyone involved be held accountable and brought to justice. In a separate trial, gunman Christopher Love was found guilty and the only one who was eventually sentenced to death. The Hatcher family vowed to attend his eventual execution. Brenda Delgado eventually went on trial in June of 2019. Her defense relied entirely on blaming Crystal Cortez. They believed Crystal's actions were to curry favor with Brenda. They also promoted that Crystal was motivated to tell her new version of events in exchange for a plea deal, and that she was primarily motivated by money. They alleged that Brenda had no idea that Crystal was so desperate for money that she would plan a robbery of Brenda's rival. The defense believed that Crystal Cortez and Christopher Love had plans to blackmail Brenda for more cash and drugs after they murdered Kendra Hatcher. But the jury would eventually reject that defense theory because the prosecution was able to corroborate Crystal's version of events through text messages from Crystal's own phone and through third-party witness testimony. Only five days after the start of the trial, the jury convicted Brenda Delgado of first-degree capital murder. But because of the extradition deal with Mexico, Brenda was automatically sentenced on the spot to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And due to the deal she had struck up with the prosecution, Crystal Cortez was sentenced to just 35 years in prison. At her sentencing hearing, Kendra Hatcher's mother gave a moving victim impact statement where she thanked Crystal Cortez for ultimately telling the truth and assisting in providing justice for Kendra's senseless murder. She told Crystal that she hoped she would use her time in prison constructively to become a better person for the son she would someday reunite with. But she also told the co-conspirator in her daughter's murder that she would attend her every future parole hearing and argue strenuously against her early release. She told Crystal Cortez that her son would be better off getting raised by someone other than her she then took the opportunity to address Brenda Delgado directly, herself. You, Brenda Delgado, are the root of all evil. You and the other two pathetic lives you had join you on your path of destruction. In the little bit of time I've learned about you these past five days, you could have never measured up to be the woman that my daughter Kendra Hatcher was. And just so you know, Brenda Delgado, Kendra was never rich, and she was never wealthy. Kendra was blessed by a loving God and a family that loved her. Kendra worked hard to earn her beautiful place on this earth. Kendra was awarded many, many scholarships because of her dedication to human life and her zest for her own life. One thing Kendra didn't have to work hard for was her beauty, inside and out. I take comfort in knowing our God has given our Kendra the ultimate spot in heaven, a spot in which you will never see. You, Brenda Delgado, have earned your spot on this earth behind cold steel bars for the rest of your miserable, pathetic life. And if justice could have handed you a death sentence, make no mistake, I would have been there front and center. Our justice system believes that human life is priceless. It's why we as a nation have some of the harshest sentencing guidelines for murder in the entire modern world. But justice isn't blind, and for some people, these complexities mean rehabilitation is never an option. It can't be because of people like Brenda Delgado and because of people like Crystal Cortez and Christopher Love. To them, human life is a very real price. For what amounted to little more than $2,500 and a few baggies of drugs, Kendra Hatcher's light was prematurely extinguished before she ever had a chance to fully shine, before her and Ricky's love was ever fully realized. All at the hands of a scorned lover, obsessed with someone she couldn't have, and a woman she simply could never compete with. If you can't get enough Invisible Choir, join the hundreds who have already signed up for Invisible Choir Premium at patreon.com slash invisible choir. For just $5 per month, you get access to exclusive weekly mini-episodes every single Friday. There's already nearly 50 in the back catalog, along with other premium content. There's also additional levels of support that can get you access to our other exclusive show, Invisible Choir Uncensored with content that is far too graphic for the regular free feed. In addition, our U.S. customers are eligible for limited edition Invisible Choir perks at the higher tiers of support. 
So sign up today at patreon.com slash invisible choir or click the link in the show notes. Thanks for listening, everybody. Take care of each other.